Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, I'm very excited because we have with us Susan Graw. And I'm going to give you a little bit of information before I welcome her as to what her background is. And of course, she'll speak more in depth on that. She's also the author of a book called Infinite Life, Infinite Lessons, Wisdom from the Spirit World on Living, Dying, and the In-Between. Susan herself had a near-death experience at a very young age, and we're going to be talking about that incredible experience. I think you'll be very moved and inspired when you do hear what she has to say. And just a little bit about Susan. Susan is an acclaimed author, inspirational speaker, soul healer, grief expert, globally recognized intuitive medium, life coach, hypnotherapist, and a past life regressionist. She is known for her genuine and approachable demeanor. Susan has a special way of connecting deeply with her clients, providing them guidance and comfort. She uses Claire senses, and we'll talk more about that, as she communicates effectively with the spirit world, helping to bridge connections with loved ones. With over 30 years of experience in both professional and spiritual practices, Susan offers a wealth of heartfelt guidance and insight enriching the lives of those she works with through her sessions and her public engagements. Whether you are seeking connection, healing, or understanding, Susan brings her extensive expertise and empathetic approach to every interaction. And of course, I will have the links to her website, to her book, and all pertinent information running across the screen, as well as in the description of this video. So please be sure to check. And now I welcome you to Susan Grow. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited because as you heard in the intro, I have Susan Graw with us today. And I already filled you in a little bit as to who she is, what she does. But she's going to give us the honor of kind of explaining some more in depth about that. Her life is amazing, miraculous. It's so many things. And I think everyone will be so inspired uh, on what she has to say. And of course, we're going to talk about her NDE and so much more. Susan, thank you so much for joining us today. Karen, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this podcast. Good, good. So let us know. And like I said, I, I kind of did a brief intro to, for you, but give us the nutshell of who you are, your background and why we're here today. Um, I'm Susan Graw, and I am an author and a speaker. I'm an intuitive medium, and I'm a near-death experiencer, among other things. Um, I have a lot of different modalities that I do in the energy healing work, and also I'm a grief and addiction therapist. And I think that's really important to say when you're a medium, you need to know about grief. Um, I wrote a book called Infinite Life, Infinite Lessons. It just came in, so I'm so excited. I had to flash it for you. Um, and I talk about my life journey. And it starts out with my NDE, my near-death experience. And it goes on to to share the, uh, the difficulties of our life journey. And I think people believe that when you've had an NDE, everything's going to be wonderful and life's going to be easy. And that was not my journey. My journey was extremely difficult and I had to rise above and it's not easy. And so I wanted to talk a lot about that and how we can heal ourselves. And so I work with people in grief and I do mama retreats and um, things like that. Who, mamas who are grieving, who've lost their children um, with Eric's house and Dr. Laura's mama retreats and Dr. Laura Berman. Um, and that's kind of my story. I've been visiting spirits all my life ever since my NDE. They've been coming to me and um, I wake up with them. And when I was little, I would cover my head and say, go away, go away. I was really frightened of them, actually. I thought they were the boogeyman. But as life went on, they became my abnormally normal journey and they were in it. And I utilized that to help others. That sounds wonderful. So let's start with, because I think most folks would be intrigued by your NDE. Let's start, what were you like, four and a half when that happened? Mm -hmm. And by the way, hold your book up again so folks could see the beautiful cover. Lovely. I now, love I, I told you before I read that book and I was just, I, I couldn't put it down. I, I had to read it from, from front to back. So it was great. And I think folks will appreciate the exercises in there too, because they're really good for self-reflection and kind of analyzing your own grief and pain and journey. So love that. 
So let's talk about your NDE. Tell us about it from beginning to end. I I, I was like, I, I thought it was miraculous that you survived that, first of all. And your mother hearing the voice that your child's in the freezer. I don't want to give it away. So you take it away mm -hmm. and tell folks exactly what happened. Okay. So right prior to that, probably the year prior, the only thing I remember about being three years old is I would see animals float when they would pass. And that was normal to me. I didn't think anything. It just was. So when I, when I saw what I'm going to tell you about, it wasn't frightening to me. It seemed normal. Um, I was playing uh, with some boys. We were playing for it. And they told me if I wanted to keep playing that they would, uh, I had to get up in the freezer and get popsicles. And I wasn't allowed in the garage, but the garage door was open for whatever reason. We had a boat in there and maybe somebody was working there. I don't know. And so I climbed up in the freezer thinking it was plugged in. I was too young to understand that there weren't popsicles in there and that it wasn't plugged in. Um, and I climbed up in and I fa was facing inward. And it was one of the first stand-up freezers, actually, and it, that existed. And my mom had gotten it and she thought it was this wonderful thing, but then it stopped working properly. So hence the unplug. Um, I was standing in there calling, kind of calling out the names of the popsicle flavors. What do you want? What do you want? I'm reaching up and no popsicles. And so when I was getting ready to turn around and say, oh gosh, no popsicles, can I still play? The freezer door closed. And in those days you couldn't get out from the inside. So this wasn't, you know, um, and I didn't know that, but I couldn't wiggle. I couldn't move. And, and then I thought, oh, I'm in on a game. We're playing a game and it's going to be okay. And I really believed I was part of it. And then I saw that freezer or um, heard that garage door close. And I realized this isn't a game. And I have to tell you, we have an innate feeling that something's wrong when something's wrong. Even as a little child, we know something's terrible. Something bad is going to happen. And I really believed that I realized death was coming. I don't know what I understood about that, but I knew it was that bad that I was going to go away. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs. And my mother said she heard your baby's in the freezer, and but she didn't hear that until first she heard these screams. And she said it sounded like cats in heat. That was her comment to me later. And they had this high, high pitched sound when they're in heat. And um, we had a lot of land. And so she was used to that sound. And she said it sounded just like that. So she ignored it. I'm screaming. She's hearing then your baby's in the freezer and ignoring it, thinking it was just a sound um, from outside. And all of a sudden I saw three lights. It still brings, I still feel that energy. Um, it felt like angels. I understood angels. And they said, your baby's in the freezer to my mom again. She ignored it again. And I heard stop screaming. And I didn't. I kept screaming. I was terrified. And then I saw this one really bright light and it said, stop screaming. We're going to get your mommy, but first, and then I was at the bottom of these stairs. I did not see my body. I did not look back. I didn't think I saw the tunnel. And I'll tell you about that in a few minutes because I did. Um, and um, I didn't think of that then, but just, I'm going to tell you the story. Looking back, I was a child. What I saw, I didn't understand, but I understand it now. So you're going to hear it from the adult perspective. It's the only way I can give you information. So I want to say that to everyone. I did not understand what I was witnessing, but I was at the bottom of these stairs and I knew somehow innately that in the middle of this Roman Greco room, it had pillars that were broken in this open ceiling, that there was an open floor. And I don't know how I knew that. And I thought to myself, how am I going to get up these stairs? And boom, I was on the edge of this circle, what I called the well. What Dr. Raymond Moody, who I studied for my DD under, uh, my doctorate in divinity, so I could work with children that have near-death experiences, um, but he told me that is the tunnel. And I didn't know that until years and years later as an adult woman, I mean, older woman. But anyway, I called it the well and I saw movement in it and it was, it was words and they were mixing together. Now looking back like DNA, but at the time it just like words mingling. And I knew that it was prayers. And I could hear the people saying things like, you know, my mom is going to die. She's sick. Please help me. Please don't let her die. I want a new car and I'm going to turn 16. And my dad says, no, but would you really talk my dad into it? Please, God, would you please do that? And I was just hearing all different kinds of, of prayers and they were intermingling as though it was one consciousness. And um, 
I looked over to the left of me where the angels were standing, what I called angels. And I, I said, where am I? And they said, you're in the room of heart's desires. And I was pretty smart at four and a half years old. And I asked them, do you answer all those? And they said, no, Susie, sometimes what people desire the most isn't good for them. And that really bothered me because my mom used to say, just because you want it doesn't mean it's good for you. So I was really confused by that statement. Like, well, where am I that you would say that to me too? And what if my mom is right? You know, that's what was going through my head, but I could still hear these words. Um, and, and, and the feeling, the feeling was almost desperate to me. And I didn't like the feeling that I was feeling, but I also was so grateful they were listening. And the next thing I know, I, I saw this road and I called it the Yellow Brick Road because I had seen the Wizard of Oz. And I saw these beautiful pyramids and people were going and pulling from the bottom of these pyramids and they were paving a path. And innately, I knew at that time in my life, not later, that that was their life journey. And when you pull from the bottom of a pyramid, what happens? You unbalance it. And I watched them drop to their knees and pray again, you know, for help, please help me, please help me. And um, and I watched that I, I watched them come in, the them meaning the angels come in and they were removing these papers and putting it to the bottom of this pyramid. And then they went to the top of it and they pulled a paver from the top, this beautiful golden paver, and it, sh it was shining. And they went down and started paving the path. And I watched the pyramid recreate itself as though as though when you when you give of your energy, your energy recreates. Looking back, that's how I felt. Um, and I watched them pave the path. And I said, what are you doing? And they said, we are the pavers, you are not. All you have to do is walk it. And I said, what if you walk, how do you know if you're walking it right, basically? And um, they said, because we bless and block everything and make no mistake. Remember this, Susie, you can get through it through a block or a wall, battered and bruised at best, or you can shift. And if you see another wall on your journey, you shift again. And if you see another wall, you shift again until you see us paving your path. And they said, you think, and they pointed to my head, you think you know what's best for you when you take your journey. We, and they pointed to their heart, know what's best for you. And that was kind of overwhelming for me because I understood, but I didn't understand. So I was trying to figure out what they meant along this whole journey. And then I popped in the room of, of um, then the more happened, of course, and it's in the book. A lot of it's in the book. Um, I popped into um, the room of knowledge, which what people call the Akashic, Akashic records. I don't relate to that word. I relate to knowledge, the room of knowledge. And I saw what I would call today virtual books, but it was it was uh, information and it was as though they were around, there were groups of families around this information that was coming and going and coming and going as though it would pop in front of them, this information about their journey. And I was hearing them say, I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna, I'm, I can do it. I can handle it. And I'm gonna grow really, really fast. And I could hear these angelic beings, these guides saying to them, oh, honey, oh, sweetie, that's too much to go through. I witnessed today that I took the PhD in hard knocks. I know that for sure. Um, but some people would change what they, oh, okay, I'm going to just do this and this then. And some people would say, or you know, what I called people would say, um, oh, I can do it. I know I can do it. And ultimately what I heard was, is, you know, we're going to allow you to do what you feel you need to do because you have free will. And if you didn't, there'd be no reason to be there. And you'll have choices and that free will will change the destination of your journey and ultimately the decisions of how your soul expands and grows. And that's why there's free will. And I understood it a little and I, and I, then I'd watch them just be gone. And I asked, where are they going? And they said, they're going to their new incarnation. Had no idea what they meant. Um, but I listened and they said they're going to go do their life journey, Susie. That's what they're going to do. And they're going to decide what doors they're going to open with their free will and how this might look for them. And, and they said much more. And again, it's in the book. And then I went into the room of companions. And um, it was our animals, our soul animals. And from there, and, and I saw them romping and playing and I knew I didn't see any of mine because I hadn't lost an animal yet. So I had no clue 
what that meant exactly, but I did know where I was. And I saw them romping and playing and happy and young. And, and so were spirits, by the way. And the most important thing I saw was this um, giant, I wanted to call it a crystal. Not then, but now, but I still am not sure. I just know it was in a pyramid shape. And I saw these faces and these bodies moving through it very slowly. And it was this three-dimensional, almost like a hologram. And I wanted to put my hand in it and I couldn't get in. I wanted to get in it. I thought it was really cool. It looked like it was fun. It looked like they were floating. It looked like a ride to me. And I wanted to get in it. And I recognized I couldn't. And they pretty much let me know when you go there, you don't come back. That was the final place. That was the other side, the true final place. Now, that doesn't mean you didn't reincarnate, but it meant I wasn't going to have a near-death experience. I was not coming back to my mommy. So I stayed back from it. And um, I saw angels and, and they would open their mouths and the music and the words came together as one. And I understand today that and I have for many years of my life that that's why music is so healing to us. It was created in the angelic realm. It comes from the angelic realm, whatever you choose to call that, that beautiful nirvana. And um, it heals our soul. And that's what angels are for. That's what that place is for, to heal us. I ended up in this amazing field. And you know those... Uh, little flowers that you blow on and you make a wish that's what Andy i lines look at the what just popped up i know that's so weird it's really weird. <laughs> um and um and and i saw daisies and i saw this dog what i thought was a dog but you know looking back on it i really i'm very attached to wolves and i always have been and i think it was that i i do and it sounds so mystical but it was mystical I can't change that. It was magical and mystical. And um, I felt nothing but love, pure love. And I cannot describe that here. There is nothing like that here on this planet. And we think we have unconditional love, but it doesn't really exist here. I think it exists in our soul. And uh, I looked to the left and there was this person or this being or this light on a hill and I wanted so bad to go up it. I wanted to be close to it, but instead I felt the rays come towards me and it was the brightest ray. It wasn't the individual or what I'm seeing up there. I knew it was pure love. It felt like source and it was expansive, but it didn't hurt my eyes, but it was the brightest thing I've ever witnessed. I don't know if I had eyes. It, I, I thought I did. I thought I was me. Um, and that's how I remembered me. So it felt normal to feel that way, but it didn't hurt my eyes, but it expanded beyond understanding and reason. And I saw this light come moving towards me, this bright love come moving towards me. And before I could ask who it was, uh, an angel came out of this cobblestone floating and I wanted to float with her really bad. And I probably was, but I didn't think I was. And for me, it was now a game. I want to float. I'm going to float. And she came and she said, it's time to go. And I said, okay. And I thought, okay, we're going to go float. This is going to be so fun. I probably was floating, but I don't recall feeling that. I recall being next to a, a, a lake or a river. And she said, you're going to go through the water to go back home. And we all go through water. Water is our healing mechanism. And it, it helps us travel. And I didn't know what she was saying, but she told me I was going to have a, a very difficult journey. And that I would help people in, in my older ages when I grew up. I was going to be a big girl and I was going to help others. Sorry. She was very powerful. Oh. And she said, are you ready? And I said, no way. Mm -mm. I didn't understand, but I knew when she said I was going to have pain and I was going to hurt and have a hard time. I didn't want that. And she said, we're going to take you back to your mommy. And of course, right. yes, I wanted to go back. And I remember stepping into the water and then my mom said she heard again, your baby's in the freezer. And she said it was between anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours. I'm sure it's somewhere in between. I don't know. I cannot answer the question. Um, but she said she ran outside, uh, threw the garage door open, 
uh, went to the refrigerator and or freezer and opened it. And I, she spun me around and I was ashen and she let go of me to go get a phone because they weren't cell phones. Mm -hmm. And I dropped and I cracked open my jaw, which I still have my little scar. And um, I took a breath. And my mother was so afraid that my father would get mad at her that she didn't take me to the hospital. She said, you were breathing. I thought you would be okay. My sister's like, we need to go to the doctor. You know, my sister was panicking and my mom put me to bed. And when I woke up from that, she put a little Band-Aid. I remember feeling the Band-Aid going on me and I went to bed. And when I woke up from that, I could see people everywhere. And they were talking to me and I was terrified. And I remembered every detail. There's so much more to it. And my heart, my, my soul was so bound to all of that. It was so connected. And I just wanted to be loved again like that. And so I spent my whole life being bullied and everything else because I was the little girl that just needed to be loved like that. And I didn't understand why people didn't love me. I was a very kind child. And I, I still till this day don't understand why we can't give that kind of love, but I'm not even capable of it. I find fault in people, you know, and I have to correct myself all the time. I'm human. And, um, but that's, that's the story of what happened to me. Kind of leaves you speechless a little bit. Um, when your mom got that message, she heard that intuitively, correct? Yes, yes. And, you know, I was telling her, even before I crossed, I was saying, Mommy, I'm in the freezer. And I was saying it in my head because I was screaming so loud I couldn't scream and talk. Mm. And she was hearing me. And I think that was my first real understanding of how to communicate from the spirit world. I do. I think it was a lesson for me on what was going to happen later in my life. I did not want to communicate with the spirit world. I'm very analytical. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I have my doctorate in divinity. I, I, I'm a, I'm a therapist. I, you know, I study, I'm very studied and I, and it means everything to me. And I have a very analytical brain. So I, I didn't want to be a medium and I didn't even know what that was. I actually later in life when the, when I found out I was a medium, it was because I called, I was getting these visitations and finally someone I loved passed away, which was my Nana. I didn't know she died. She came to me and talked to me as though she was right there in the room. I wasn't asleep. Almost all my visitations have been when I've been awake and I don't dream about them very often. That's very rare for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I called UCLA because they were studying ESP and I looked up, you know, what, what's happening to me. And they called that ESP at the time. And I called them and the man, this very kind man said to me, it sounds like you're a medium, what we call a medium. And I said, what is that? And they said, you talk to people who are dead. And I freaked out and I hung up the phone and I didn't talk about it. I was terrified by what he said. Like I'm talking to dead. That really scared me. I didn't know they were dead. They were more alive to me than you. They were so alive. And, and, and even though I didn't understand everything they said, I, I was familiar with them in some way. And, but as a little girl, I understood the boogeyman. Right. So that made sense to me. But later on in life, it didn't stop. And I would be woken up. So-and-so's brother, sister's best friend died. They think she committed suicide. It was an accident. Please tell them it's me. It's me and I'm okay. And, I, and, and this is what happened. And I would write it down because I didn't know what to do with it. And then I'd find out so-and-so sister's brother's friend died. And the name was right. And, and it, it, it all made sense. That was mind blowing to me. When P, even till this day, when I do my readings, when people say, oh my, they hold, you know, oh my God, how did she know that? I'm saying inside, this is my little secret. Oh my God, how did I know that? Mm -hmm. How is that possible? I know there are people that do the wrong thing and they look people up and they they find out information, especially right. in this day. But when I started doing that, that wasn't possible. Right. There was no internet and I was accurate. And I helped people heal with it. So my grief work and therapeutic work became mediumship because people would tell me that 15 minutes of you telling me this information or that hour, this hour was more important than the three years you've worked with me. It, it meant more to me. It healed me more. And so they started to tell people and I started to take a look at that. Still didn't want to do it. 
still remain just grief therapist, addiction therapist is what I did mostly. I did not want to do more and it just kept coming. And one day I couldn't deny it. Hmm. Now your mom told you not to speak of such things when you were little to people, right? Mm -hmm. because, yes, because I'm just imagining what it would be like to be five, six years old, filled with all of this knowledge and having to keep it you know, a secret and not not I didn't. People. I didn't. That was the problem. Uh, my mother was um, put in a hospital, <clears throat> actually locked in a hospital for a couple weeks and put on all kinds of medication because she had a, a, a nervous breakdown from it. My sister had this gift. My brother had this gift. They just had it in a different way. Right. And my brother actually became schizophrenic and he committed suicide because of it and because he couldn't stop hearing the voices. Um, and addiction. That was part of it too. Because well, you'll see that hand medicine. in hand. A lot of them camouflage their abilities with drugs and alcohol. So I've mm -hmm. heard that before, mm -hmm. sadly. So my mother came to me and said, there's nothing here. You're not seeing anything. Don't talk about it. And, um, but I would play in my living room. My family called it the creepy room. My brothers and sister called it the creepy room because I'd be in there playing, you know, Beatles and, you know, I'd be playing, I'd be talking to spirits. And then I'd realize that they, there was no human there. And I'd say, I pretend my dad was home in the shower. And I'd say, I know you're an expert in judo karate and Aikido daddy. And I know you're in the shower and thinking that they wouldn't know better, you right. know, right. but I was so confused by what was going on. Yet I was so comfortable in their presence that they became my friends. And I would be with friends and I, I would be playing and I'd say, oh, your, gra your grandma or your Nana wants to play. And they'd say, that's so mean. My Nana died. And they'd, I actually got beat up one time for it. Um, and, you know, a little kid beat up, you know, yeah. it wasn't anything serious. Yeah. But I couldn't not talk about it. It was there. But then I realized I'm being ridiculed and I'm being harmed by this and I'm different and I'm scared. And so I stopped talking about it, but it kept coming. I actually got married and didn't tell my husband. I was going to ask you that, how your husband felt about such things. He did. Well, I, I was married for 10 years to my childhood sweetheart. And unfortunately he got involved. And I think it goes hand in hand when you're raised with addiction in your life and you've seen it so much that you intend to marry it. And I did. And um, he's sober now and God bless him. And, but I had to leave the situation and I had never told him. I just would say things like, oh, your your aunt died. She came to me last night and he'd go, go to sleep. Like I'd wake him up and he'd say, go to sleep. Really look at me weird. And then he'd find out she died, but he never, you know, he was high a lot. Right. Let me just say that. Um, and then I married someone who wasn't addicted and I didn't say anything. And I thought he'd think I was crazy like my, my first husband did. And I've been married now 38 years to him. And let me tell you, he believes it wholly. Oh, and it's yeah. because he's seen me do my work, but he didn't see me do my work until about 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I wouldn't let him come because I was afraid he'd call me crazy. Right. And then when he finally saw my work and he saw the impact, I was doing a platform and I was telling people about their loved ones and things that I couldn't know. And they were sobbing and crying and saying, nobody knows that that's not anywhere. How could you know that I had that conversation or how could you know that about them? And um, he said uh, it, it revealed itself to him. He never ridiculed me for it, but I just didn't talk about it. Mm. You know, I'd say, oh, I had this visitor last night. And he'd go, wow. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. He'd just go, wow. Like, cool. <laughs> you know, he didn't ask me any questions. Right. And I'd tell him everything. And my kids grew up with it. And my kids are all adopted. And my kids grew up with it. And they have it. But they don't want anything to do with it. It's a really cool story. I have to tell you this. It's a really fun story. My daughter, I had a visitor uh, at about, I don't know, 530 in the morning. And, and I saw this body with no head and uh. they wouldn't tell me who they were. I thought it was my brother or my mother-in-law, but they wouldn't tell me who they were. So um, I told them to go away. That's what I do when I don't get identification because it scares me a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Not because there's bad spirits. I've never seen one, but because it just scares me. And um, it went out my my door, my bedroom door. My daughter had gotten up really early. She was going to the gym and she was starting to cook some, you know, protein breakfast. And she said she turned around and she goes, "Mom, there was this person staring at me, and it had no head." And I oh, said, "Honey, geez. how do you know it was staring at you if it had no head?" 
And she started laughing and she said, because I could feel it. That told me right there. She felt him. And she said, I ran down the hallway and I covered my head with my pillows and blankets and I told it to go away. It wow. scared me so much. And we had this huge laugh about the, you know, I can't see, you know, and they can see me and I can't see ahead. But that's how it is. That's Did sometimes you find out who is. that was? It was my brother. Oh, it was. And he was a jokester. So, so, but uh, my other daughter saw my father when he died. She saw a child stood in front of her and said, don't, don't go, don't drive. She was eating at a, a little drive through with all of her friends in high school and said, don't drive, don't drive. And she didn't. And there was a pile up and a, a lot of the children died. Oh. And she said to her friend, do you see that kid in front of me? I tell it to move. And she goes, what kid? And she kept saying the kid in front of my car. And she said, there's nobody there her friend. And so my daughter, I knew my other daughter had it, but she wants nothing to do with it too. She, they don't like it. It's not safe. That's okay. Them. That's, yeah. you know, that's their personal preference. I mean, they love hearing my stories and they right. love to know I can do that. And they always have their friends come to me and, and, um, they want to help people. They're very loving people and they want to help people, but they just don't want to do it themselves. That's nice. That's really nice. I can't help but ask you this because Lately, a lot of people have that I've been talking to and that I see on like YouTube videos and things, they're saying that a lot of the spirit world and mediumship and crystals and tarot cards and all that stuff is demonic. And that, right, I'm sure you've run across that a lot. My whole life. Well, what do you have to say about that? Because I don't get the feeling that it, I think it could be, because I, I absolutely believe that there are, are demonic entities and presence on the earth, but I don't get that feeling that these gifts are demonic in any way. What can you say to people otherwise? Well, first thing people say to me, prove to me that there's a spirit world there that you can talk to. And I say, when you prove to me that there isn't, I will prove to you that there is. That's usually my response to that. Um, I have never done a demonic evil thing in my lifetime. Not purposely, at least. I don't think I ever have. Um, and I can't believe that healing would be demonic or evil. It makes no sense to my soul. When I'm helping people heal, there's a beauty behind it. And they walk away understanding that there is a God and there is love and there is spirit. How can that be demonic? How can that be evil? That makes no sense to me. And then they'll say, well, Satan's fooling you. And I said, well, he's been fooling me for 65 years then. And when's he going to come out and say, uh, you're not going to heal people anymore. You're going to be evil because it hasn't happened. I don't entertain evil at all. What we Fear, we feed. What we feed, we perceive. And what we perceive becomes our reality. So I do not entertain evil. I come from a space of love and light and beauty and healing. And if someone can mark that or market that as evil, that is in them, not me. I can't, I can't do anything about that. I can just tell them that you don't need to fear the love on the other side. They want you to heal. They want to help you. They love you. And that's the best answer I can give them. Well, that answer is perfect. It makes so much sense. And you can feel that it's so right. But but because there are, I mean, I, I, I agree with you totally that if you invite the demonic into your life, if you think about it, read about it, you know, you make it become a part of your world. And I, I, I absolutely am on board with you with that. So Susan, what do people do when they're messing with like Ouija boards and bringing all this negativity and evil into their life and they start experiencing a lot of this negativity, what can they do to get out of that? Keep in mind that intention is everything. The Ouija board was a child's game. It was created as a child's game by Hasbro. Think I know I had one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it wasn't for evil intent. It was a child's game. Our intention is everything. Hmm. So if you have something that you feel, so I believe evil is in the minds of man, mankind, not men, mankind. 
I want to be clear about that. Um, I, I truly believe that if you feel that something is around you that is unsafe, that you can call upon the angels, the guides, your loved ones, the spirit world, what you believe your God is, whatever that is, to remove your fear. Because when you feed fear, fear comes on stronger. When you feed evil, evil exists in your, in, in your environment. That's the way it works. Anything you feed. And That's so true. it's it's working towards, you know, if you don't have mental illness, which people do sometimes um, that have this, even mediums who do good deeds have mental illness sometimes. So if it's not mental illness you're dealing with and you've investigated that, I suggest that you ask the spirit world to help you and you trust that they will because the trust is everything. It's the same way that you trust that you know, the car is going to start and it doesn't start and you go, I need to get a mechanic in here. Get the, get the beautiful spirit world in the room. The love. You have to believe if you believe there's dark, you have to believe there's light because they can't coexist without each other. Mm -hmm. It's like the backdrop of the stars. They cannot coexist. You could not see the stars without the dark. All right. So if you believe that there is light and you believe that it is powerful and all knowing, and most people who believe in evil do believe that, then believe that they can help you and ask them to help you. And they will. And That's then okay. once they do, please stop entertaining it. Anything, if I feel something evil, which I don't, but if I did, and I was, so fear to me can be evil. Fear can be our, our friend if a, a tiger's chasing us, but fear right. can be evil too. Um, fear tells us things that aren't true. It lies to us. Mm -hmm. It feeds things and it makes things bigger than life. So if I'm walking down the street and someone comes out of their house, I can go right to fear. He's going to chase me. He's going to, I can go right. down the roads sure. of terror and then nothing happens. And I, and it, I fed it. And so it was super strong. I would ask you not to feed that evil that you feel. Don't feed it. You give it strength. Mm -hmm. And when you give strength to something, it becomes powerful. So when I feel something that is uncomfortable to me, which I have felt un discomfort, just not evil, I immediately say, I'm not going to fear this. I will not. I refuse. I want light and love in my life. And I feel safe. And it, and it leaves. Wonderful. Fear is only your friend when it's truth. Hmm. And it doesn't need to be your truth. What is karmic and dharmic soul growth? Karmic soul growth is so uh, an example is easier than describing it. It would take too long, but karmic is I've done something in my journey that I want to know about. I want to understand it better. My soul has not completely understood it and my body, mind, and spirit. So I'm going to have an event occur that feels very similar to that, but it will be flipped. So for instance, I'm cruel to someone and I punch them in the face. Later in life, someone's cruel to me and I feel that feeling that I created. And it happens all the time in our journey. We go, ooh, I remember when I did that. That felt really bad. I wish I wouldn't have done that. We make a change. We, we shift the energy. And so karma is there to teach us. It is not there to punish us. It is, And we choose it, by the way. We have free will. When we leave here, we can say, I want to understand that. I want to go back and understand that um, so that I can heal that inside of me, whatever choice I made. Dharmic events is universal energy of love and giving. And so if I come here dharmically, I've probably worked through a lot of my karma. That doesn't mean I won't have karma here. Karma is on this planet. Karma is now. And it can, you can come back with it, but karma is now. I had it happen to me at five. Now I'm doing it to someone at 20. Oh, ow, that hurts. And I changed that behavior. Uh, dharmically, I come universally bringing love and light to the world. And we have different types of journeys. So my journey here now is dharma. It's dharmic. I want to give, I want to help people heal. I want to bring love and light to the world. And that's just who I am innately. I didn't have to search to be that. I wanted to be that. I wanted to give love and be loved. If I came here karmically, wanting to know what it's like not to be loved or to not give love and to live alone and be, be singular because I did that to someone else or someone did that to me and I didn't understand it, I would mm -hmm. come here karmically. We have both. 
We have both. So when I've done something unkind, I, I, ow, I feel it. And I want to change that and use my dharmic behavior, my dharma to bring love and light. Beautiful. Um, who are our soul guides, our spirit guides? Are they people that we knew in the past or, you know, that have passed away? Or are they just people that are assigned, spirits that are assigned to us? How does that work? I believe, I believe there's spirits that are assigned to us, but they're assigned by, by proxy. So um, I had a life previously with them. Maybe they don't want to come back. And they say to me, but I want to be in your life in the journey. Now, for people who don't believe in, in other lifetimes, the only thing I can say is for me to believe that I can do it all in one lifetime is almost crazy for me. For me, I can't understand how I could do everything that I need to learn in one lifetime. But if they don't believe, that's okay. They are assigned to you. I believe my guides know me very well and have known me in previous journeys. And they've decided not to take that journey with me. And they change as we go through our journey. They're not just one singular guide and they can change. So maybe for the first five years of my life, they're guiding me and then they decide to come. And that's been decided. But for those first five years, they understand the world because they've been in it. Angels have never walked on this planet with their own accord. So in other words, they don't walk, they float. And they are pure love. If they landed on this planet where all this hate exists and all this pain exists and love, but there is all the negative too, um, they would implode, I think. Mm. And I learned that they don't exist here. Can they go into someone's body, part of them and help others? Yes, they can enter part of them, but they don't come in totality here. They are pure love guides have been here and they're not pure love. And they're going to tell you, what are you thinking? Why did you do that? Don't take that drug. Don't go down that street. That's going to harm mm -hmm. you. Do something different. They're more real. Is that realistic. our intuition then speaking? Like we, we all have intuitive feelings and thoughts. Is that our spirit guides doing, talking to us that way, communicating? Yes. So communication only goes through the brain because our brain can give us linguistics. It has language. True intuition is in our gut. It comes in through our gut. It comes through the soul into our gut. And the soul is, is never broken. It's never damaged. It is our go-to place. So when it comes in, it comes in very pure. And it is an, an instant knowing. What we do is we send it up to our brain for the linguistics of understanding it, mm -hmm. and it becomes diluted. So the goal is to feel it here and trust it. So your gut goes, ooh, that doesn't feel good. That person feels unsafe to me. Instantly mm. trust that. So a, a great uh, lesson in that would be, say you're going into an elevator. There's a man who wrote the, the Gift of Fear. It's a beautiful book and everyone should read it, The Gift of Fear. And I, for whatever reason, his name has left me, but, but it is a book every human should read. Mm. And um he talks about going to an elevator and you see it comes up and you see someone and you it, the door opens and you feel this instant feeling of something's not safe. Instead of honoring it, we send it to our brain and we process it as, oh, I'm just being silly. Oh, I don't want to hurt this person's feelings. I don't want to be rude. Mm -hmm. We get into the elevator and something happens. Right. That is a danger sign. That is that is not listening to our intuition. If I initially feel that feeling, I trust it almost always. And it's not scary. So how, would, how do we tell the difference between fear and intuition? Intuition is smooth. It comes in easy and smooth. No matter what the message is, it's an instant knowing. So it can't come in any other way. It doesn't have time to get to our head to create fear. Fear comes in dark, it comes in panic. It comes in deep and down and scary. And so that's how I tell the difference. So if my head's in the way, it's going, oh my God, that might be someone dangerous. I need to run, right? There's dark, scary, panic. Right. My intuition goes, don't get in the elevator. You're not safe. Ah, That's how we tell the difference. And if we work hard at learning that and practice it, we become adept at it. So we keep ourselves safe. We can help our loved ones. We know where we are in any environment. I can walk into a room and say, that person's an alcoholic. That's a pedophile. That's wow. a safe person. That's someone I could leave here with 
and so on, because I trust my initial instinct, right. regardless of right or wrong. I learned how to be right by being wrong. Yeah. Those are all characteristics of empaths too, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to us and not everyone bit. is. Well, right. an empath is someone that feels the energy around them. Um, they're the kind of people that people walk up to them in the grocery store, look into their eyes and can see into their soul that they're safe and start telling their story. My husband says to me, when I go somewhere, if we're in a hurry, look down, don't stare at anyone. Don't look at anyone. Ah, that's funny <laughs> because they'll stop me and I'll listen and, um, and I'll be their, their sounding board. And they know that by looking into my soul, they can feel the safety. Uh, that's an empath. An empath is someone that feels so much that sometimes they don't know how to be here. And you'll find that a lot of empaths want to leave the planet. I tell them, hang on, hang on, because it will change. And you'll be so filled with gratitude that you weren't the bully, you weren't the narcissist, you weren't the sociopath. I used to work with them, so I know how they are, narcissists and sociopaths. Now I work with empaths. Um, but they are, they are all-knowing in some odd way. Mm -hmm. And they are very connected. So I call the, the soul the divine vine to the divine. Mm. So it's the divine to the divine and it has a vine to it and it pumps what we would call blood. It's, you know, it's a, it's a growth area and the soul is pure and the empath is in touch with their soul. It is never damaged. It can never be harmed. You can have a broken heart. You can die from a broken heart. Oh, sure. You can have a broken spirit. You know how people say, break that horse's spirit. It's a horrible mm -hmm. thing to say, but people say things like that. Yes. Yep. And then they'll do what you want. We can have a broken spirit and we can have broken, distorted thinking from our distortion in our journey. Those are not healthy things. Okay. Those are painful things. The soul is there to help us heal. If your soul was broken and my soul was broken, where would we go to heal? Right. There'd right. be nowhere. So now I'm writing all about that in my new book. Um, and it's it's powerful because it talks about how we can tap into the soul. So the empath has an innate ability to do that, if only for a second. They can tap into that pure knowing and that healing mechanism, that safety net, and then help others with it. Right. I think lots of times what happens with empaths is they're always giving, 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 and not receiving and not knowing self-love and how to take care of their own being. And they kind of get lost in that and worn out and just tired of always being on the giving end of things. So I think finding that balance is, is so important too. Absolutely. That's such a great thing. What you just said, it's so powerful. If you don't have balance, you're in trouble. Now Absolutely. I want to, I want to bring this to people's attention though. Sometimes we think we're not in balance and we are. So if I were to take a one pound rock and put it on a scale that goes like this, mm -hmm. and I put the other side, I put a one pound rock The wind comes, it's going to look unbalanced, isn't it? Right. But it will rebalance. Mm -hmm. So know that through your life, as things are looking unbalanced, it will go back to balance. If you've chosen balance and you've worked hard to have that. So I don't want people to think because it looks balanced and they think they're balanced, they're totally out of balance and everything's wrong because it gets unbalanced for a moment because the wind comes hmm. uh, and moves it around for a while. You can find your balance again. And so I think that's important for people. Oh, to know that's such because, a beautiful thing. Yeah, because I go off balance all the time from the winds of my life. Right. And the ebb and flow. Think of the ebb and flow yes. of the ocean. And I get off balance, but I always remain on my feet and get rebalanced at some point. Even if a wave knocks me over, I end up running out of it and jumping onto my feet and rebalancing myself. And that's oh, our journey. That's beautiful. I love that. I can't help, but I don't think you mentioned it in your book. The boys that did this to you, because I'm like, I'm all about righteous, like ju justice. You know what I mean? Like, I just kept thinking these boys that did this to you, locked you in the freezer, seemed to me to be very intentional. Like they, they closed the garage door. They Did anybody approach them as, because they were older than you. Did anybody say, hey, you almost killed Susie? Like what happened? I, I think my mom probably did. I never heard the whole story, but I do know she went to their house to find out how long I'd been in there and they had been out playing. And the mother said, well, they just got home a little while ago. Um, but they were outside playing. I could see them outside. I don't know how long she was in there. That's why I can't tell you. Um, 
they were bullies and they had done a lot of things to me, a lot of things on my journey, which I share. Yeah. And, um, you know, people that are bullies congregate together, just like pedophiles congregate together. And unfortunately I was in that world, you know, and, and so they didn't you said really you care. moved and it and it followed you, right? Like, didn't you move and like the same people kind of well, I think once you, you so I, you know, just for full disclosure, I yeah. was trafficked in my neighborhood right. by um pornographers and I was passed around and a lot of children were. I wasn't the only one. Right. And once you have that, your goal is always to be loved by them because mm-hmm. what they do is they take love from you and you're a child. And they're saying, if you don't do this, I will hate you. I will not love you. I will punish you. I will. And so you have this energy of just love me. So even when I was older and I moved and I got um, molested uh, more than once, um, I I kept going back to that person because I just wanted them to love me. And mm. when I wouldn't go back, they would treat me like I was invisible. It's nothing worse than feeling like you don't exist in someone else's eyes. There is nothing more cruel, by the way, than mm. uh, in my opinion, I'd rather you tell me you don't like me and you hate me and whatever you have to say and tell me off than right. to ignore me as though I'm non-existent in the world. And that's what they do. And so for me, when I did tell on them, they would, uh, they congregated, so they would move away and they would ridicule me and they would move away physically back away from me and show me just how disgusting I was. And so I would, you know, open myself up again to just love me, do anything. I don't care. Don't do this. And so, yes, it repeats itself. And that happens to people that are abused. And that's the sadness of it is that when it doesn't get healed, it, it doesn't heal and it and it has other it has another life to it and that life is damaging i did that for a lot of my years you know i i i let people use me physically and abuse me uh even in my young adulthood i didn't i didn't know how to do it any different and i wanted control so some people who get abused and i want people to understand that neither one is bad i do want to say that just briefly but some people mm-hmm. that get abused they um they have nothing to do with anyone and they go into a shell and they disappear i wanted control so i allowed things to happen to me i allowed them at that point because i didn't want them to have control and i knew who they were and so i would allow it and i became promiscuous in my young years i changed that when i healed that ended for me and i honored my body and my soul I didn't do that when I was in my teens and young, you know, twenties, because I, I wanted power. So I was safe. I thought it would make me safe. And all it did was damage me. more. Right. So they they were nice boys. You're quite, I'm so sorry. I digressed into that. Oh no, it's all a part of your story. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, they were nice boys and I don't think they grew up to be nice boys. If I look back and think about the things that they did and, and who they were, maybe someone was doing that to them. Yeah, could be. But usually one of them was age. a teenager, quite older. Oh, geez. And he knew better. Regardless, I knew better. I didn't abuse children. I knew better. So he knew better and he chose that. And that's those are the ones that I feel ended up being narcissistic, sociopathic, you know, psychopaths, whatever they were. Right. Um, regardless of what happened to me, I always tried to do the right thing and I never injured someone sexually. Right, right, right. Uh, to my knowledge, I never tried to at least. Um, and I certainly didn't hurt a child. So we do know better. So can pe- can anyone communicate with loved ones that have passed? Is it yes. something we can learn how to do? Yes, absolutely. And my book talks about some of how to do right. that. Um, you have to practice. It's like anything. If I, if you want to play tennis, you can't go out and be a tennis pro. You have to practice. And if you stop practicing, you won't be as good when you go back out to do it again. It's like right. a piano, right? And so you, I have practiced my whole life because it's what I do for a living. So yes, people see me and they go, I'll never read like her. I'll never be able to give that information. And I tell them, yes, you will. If you practice the way I have. 
I do it on a daily basis. Right. You know, I have an office. I work with people every day. Um, so you do have to practice. You do have to put a lot of energy into it. But the, the most important thing, trust. If you get a message and you don't trust it, you've taught them, whether it's right or wrong, you've taught them not to give it that way. So now they're trying uh -huh. a new way and they're trying a new way. If you get a message and you say, I'm just going to trust right or wrong, that that's you, what you've told them, your loved ones, is you're going to listen that way. So now they're going to go, oh, even though that wasn't me that time, I'm going to do it now because you've told them you're going to trust it. The messages they give are abstract in form. They're not clear. They don't speak our language. We have to become knowledgeable about the language they speak. If they did speak just English, I wouldn't know how to talk to someone in Japanese. Exactly. Right? That is crossed. So they have their own language and we have to learn to understand it. Will it mean that you'll do it to the degree I do it? Maybe not. Maybe you're not meant to do that in this lifetime. Maybe you're just meant to talk to your loved ones. But how many times does something happen where you've heard a song and you've gone, God, I feel like they just gave me that song. Right. That's a communication. So we all have that happen to us. We just don't always trust it. And we're taught not to, unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah. People want to fear this instead of embracing it. And I understand. I do. I was feared it when I was four and a half. I understand okay. the fear of it. But it's, it's amazing. That before we go, I appreciate you sticking around past the hour too. Um, when you were young, four and a half, five, you had this amazing, miraculous NDE. When did you start remembering the nuances of it? Because it must have been so overwhelming after it happened. Did did the memory of it like unfold as you got older, like visiting all the rooms and having these conversations with the angels? Did that unfold for you during like so many years? Or was it just a blast of memory? Like, how did that work? Both. So I, I remembered everything. I've had more than one visit into the spirit world. I had a brain tumor. I, it's a whole nother story. It's, it would take too long to share, right. but my new book will share it. Um, I, um, I, I knew I remembered everything, but I didn't understand everything. I understood some of it, what a child can understand and comprehend at four and a half years old. All of my life, I've gotten downloads and I'd go, oh my gosh, now I know what that meant. Oh, wow. that makes sense now. And it would just come to me. Something would happen and it would just come to me. And that still happens to me. And so I just accept that because it makes sense. It has to make sense. The spirit world makes sense. Right. People don't know that. If it doesn't make sense, walk away. Be done with it. Right. It needs to make sense. They're not up there giving, throwing us bones. They're telling mm -hmm. us and they're giving us pure sense, common sense information. And... um. So if, if somebody's giving you a reading and it makes no sense at all, or someone's trying to put fear in you and it makes no sense to you at all, it's not it's not truth. Right. And know that. And so as it makes sense, yes, if I go through I figured journey. that it it kind of happened in downloads to you where, because a four and a half year old brain couldn't possibly comprehend all of that. So it must have been like an amazing journey for you to go, oh, wow that's what this room meant that they took me to. And so you yes. saw all that like unfolding over time then, right? Yes. And then you began to understand yes. it. I, I, again, appreciate you extending your time with us. And I would love to follow up. I have so many other questions that I'm, I'm sure our listeners would love answered. So when you have time, because I know you're super busy, I would love to reconnect with you again. Before we go, let us know about your website, let us know what services you offer folks. Let us know how they can contact you if it's via your website and what you're working on moving forward. And then we'll we'll say goodbye. Okay. Uh, my website is susangraw.com. All of my social media is Susan Graw Official. So everything I do goes on my social media. I offer uh, to help people that have NDEs. Um, I'm passionate about it. I do mediumship. Yes. I do, um, intuitive work. I am not a psychic. I want to be very clear about that. I actually have a problem with that for me, uh, because I know the free will and the power of the free will. 
And if I know your free will and what you're going to do next, then it's not free will, it's a planned event. That's how I look at it. So I can't, uh, in in all honesty, give future readings. But what I can do is give you a trajectory um, of what things could happen and what doors might come in front of you. And you can decide what choices you want to make. Um, I do grief work. I uh, still do addiction counseling, grief counseling. I do Reiki. I do Sayama Diksha. Um, I, I could go on and on. I do, I teach metaphysics. I teach people how to connect with their loved ones and I do online events and I speak, I'm a speaker and I do events with Hay House. So, um, yeah, I do all that. That's, and we'll see what else did you ask me? Oh, that's amazing. And then, thank you. And then my book, of course, it's, that's either out or coming out, uh, depending upon, um, which book it is. So my next book will be coming out in, um, I'm hoping in within the year, we'll see. I'm, I, I am struggling with it. I have to be honest because it's about the soul and it's about broken heart. It's about, you know, how do we mend the shadows that bind us mm-hmm. and the ones that are behind us, you know, and how do we heal that? And it is called everything I do is infinite. So even my podcast is infinite wisdom um, because that word is so powerful for me. Yes. Um, so it, it's called infinite healing and it's uh, wisdom from the spirit world on healing the shadows that bind us. And it is all about the soul and the purity of the soul and that the soul is there to help you heal. It is not broken. There are not soul wounds. Does the fe- soul feel our pain? Yes, but it is so powerful that it doesn't wound the soul. So you do have somewhere to go internally. When people tell you to go inside and figure it out, that's where you go. Don't go to your head, your hair's, your thinking's distorted. Go to your soul and it will give you the right answers. Your oh, soul always that. knows. I love and, that. Yeah. And, um, and so that's what I'm working on now. Oh, so exciting. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. And God bless and thank you for for all this wonderful information. Again, I will have all the links running across the screen, as well as in the description of the video to your book, your website, and all that good stuff. So folks, kindly please check it out. And if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section below. And hopefully Susan will find a little bit of time and maybe pop in and answer some of the questions. Yes. I forgot to say this. I'm doing book signings. I have one the 20th of July at Irvine Spectrum, uh, California. I have one at Mystic Journey Bookstore on, I think it's the 27th. It's a Saturday of July. And then I am doing my book launch at The Grove Mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And that is on October 20th. So if you want to meet me, I would love for you to come and buy a book and let me sign it for you. And if you have, we're going to be doing Q&As and I'm going to be having some pretty powerful mediums there and healers. Oh, so um, we'd love to have you come. Is this information on your website as well? It will be coming as soon as it's announced. It's not quite announced yet, but yes. But uh, more importantly, my social media. Okay. So Facebook, Instagram, where else are you? TikTok. 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 Uh, what but I really, I, I love Instagram. Instagram's really powerful. I put everything there and I talk a lot on Instagram and I do free live readings for people that cannot afford to have a reading um, because, you know, I, I understand that that's a real reality in people's worlds. Right. And so I do free lives and hopefully they'll be chosen. So there's a lot to Good. gain. Good. Also, I will, I will make sure I put all your social media too for them okay. to find you. If they pre-order the book, so here's something really exciting that I didn't share and I keep forgetting. Um, If they go to my website and pre-order the book, Mm -hmm. you'll see a pop-up. I'm doing 13 Zooms for free once a month to go over each chapter of the book. Oh, how exciting. Yes. And there's a mini book there that you get to download that I wrote all about little portions of the book, but more importantly, about what you can do to connect with the spirit world. And it's free. And this is for people that pre-order. Yes. Oh, how brilliant. What a great yeah. idea. All right, good. I'm, I'm going to make sure I put all that information for folks to uh, to check out. Okay. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, Susan. It was a privilege speaking with you. And I, I know we're going to feel the same. Again. I feel the same. Thank you for having me. And, and thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.